This is Austin Liddy Limits, where authors talk to authors about books and the craft of storytelling. Sponsored by Blue Ink Review, because typing the end is just the beginning. Find out more at blueinkreview.com. In this episode, Larry talks with New York Times bestselling author Christopher Moore. Chris grew up in Mansfield, Ohio, and he proved the early predictions that he would spend his adult life as a small town used car salesman wrong when at age 19, he moved to the west coast of California. He published his first comic novel, Practical Demon Keeping, in 1992, and has kept his readers laughing through 18 subsequent books. His latest is Razzmatazz, a story full of vintage Christopher Moore silliness set in 1947 San Francisco. Christopher Moore, one of my favorite authors. Uh, good to have you here today. Thanks. Nice to be here. We are at Book People, and he is doing an event a little bit later today. The first question that I want to ask you is because your your books are fantasy, they're science fiction, mm -hmm. they're murder mysteries, mm -hmm. they're especially the newest book that we're promoting, Raz Mataz, mm -hmm. uh, has a lot of those elements. How do you balance them all? Um, I, I, they're, they're probably conventions or tropes of certain genres that I just like to play with. And one of the things that I, attracted me to doing the noir uh, genre was the language, the tough guy talk, and not just from the books, you know, uh, Raymond Chandler, or Dashiell Hammett, and all, all of those, and Jim Thompson and James M. Cain, but the movies of that of the 30s and 40s, and you know, even back to The Thin Man and stuff like that, and the stories of Damon Runyon, who has the greatest, funniest dialect that he made up, um, writing from the 20s to 40s. So I just wanted to play with language. And then, you know, so you create characters, the characters carry the story, I fill it in with history. This takes place in 1947 in San Francisco, so there's a lot of historical accuracy amid all the crazy things going on. And then my readers now, this is my 18th book, they expect something to, they're like, this isn't a Christopher Moore book, this seems way too normal. And so then things have to go off the rails a bit. Sure. And you manage it in that, you know, if I can do it, then it's managed. If I can't do it, then I have to edit it out or something like that. And so that's, I don't know if it's handled, but people seem to like it. This is a book that is basically the second of the noir books. Mm -hmm. And the first book was called Noir. Mm -hmm. um, and it features, you know, Sammy Two Tones Tiffin, mm -hmm. Two Toes Tiffin, mm -hmm. and his girlfriend Stilton, The, the Cheese. cheese. Mm -hmm. and a whole cast of characters. It, it feels like you're finishing noir, which is where we, you introduce mm -hmm. these characters. And then this book basically follows up on that. And it, it felt like it really wrapped up. Is there another one, possibly? I don't have anything planned. I tend to not plan sequels. I tend to do them because the circumstances of my life are such that I need to do it. I can't go research a new subject, or time doesn't allow me to do that. Um, this one... I didn't want to write anything that was contemporary because the world at large between politics and, uh, and the pandemic was just horrible. Everything was horrible and I wanted, uh, and I figured everybody else needed an escape as much as I did. Um, so setting something in 1947, you know, that sort of sticks that. And this one goes back and sort of fills in the history back to the turn of the century and the earthquake in 1906 in, in San Francisco. Um, there might be another one. I like this, these characters a lot. Yeah. And I have gone as far as bringing uh, characters back from the dead when I wanted to write them again. So that's not going <laughs> to deter me at all. Um, you just make it a ghost story. Uh, so it could happen, but I don't have a plan at this point. Yeah. What was it that attracted you to doing it in the Dashiell Hammett mode? Um, I, read I mean, where did that idea come from? I, let me think. I, I'm trying to think. I, I wanted to originally, this is where you sort of get into the, the inside baseball of publishing. 
I've done a, a, a number of books that were based in Shakespeare's plays. Yeah. And that's because, again, I wanted to play with language. And I sort of, I came up with this sort of Shakespeare-ish dialect. In other words, it sounds Shakespeare, but it's easy for a modern American right. person to, to understand um, without a glossary. And um, I wanted to write A Midsummer Night's Dream with my character Pocket, who was a fool from King Lear that was in pr two previous books. And my publisher said, maybe not right now, because I just published The Serpent of Venice, which was Pocket in Venice for both Othello and The Merchant of Venice, right. and those characters. And, but I'd already done, the thing about a, a Midsummer Night's Dream is the forest, the fairy forest, can be anywhere. And that's why high schools love to do it, because the costumes are easy. They're like, let's set it in the city dump, and everybody wears trash bags. <laughs> um, and so for me, I was going to have the, uh, the contemporary setting for Pocket to be late 13th century, which the other books are. And then the fairy forest was going to be 1940s Golden Gate Park. So you would have this, this fool from sort of medieval England who was suddenly thrown into the, a bunch of these fairies and, and fairy kings and queens who spoke like guys and dolls. And, um, you know, as well as being introduced to things like automobiles and firearms and things that he wouldn't have known about. And uh, they said, no, I don't want to do the, we don't want you to do the Shakespeare book. And I had already done the research for the 1940s. Um, San Francisco part, so I thought, well, then I'm just going to do a 1940s noir send-up, and, sure. uh, and so that's how noir started, and um, and then I liked doing that, and we had the pandemic, and, and the, the whatever you want to call the dark hole of American politics was for five years, and so I wanted to not write something contemporary, so I did Razzmatazz, which I hope stands on its own. I think it's enriched if you've read noir. But I think you can go into it and go, well, this is mighty weird, but, but yeah. I kind of fill you in as you go along. Yeah, uh, and I think most good authors will do that with a yeah. follow-up book. It can stand alone or it cannot. Right, I remember reading the Travis McGee novels. Mm -hmm. I, I, never picked, I didn't know which one was first. I just picked them up in the middle and they were fine. So yeah. I kind of hope to, that that's the case with Razzmatazz. Yeah, my second book, uh, The Patterer, was set in London and it basically imagines what a, uh, if Ben Franklin invented the TV newscast, what would it look like? Oh, wow. And then my follow-up to that is after my main character moves to America and experiences the build-up to the Amer uh, American Revolution. Okay. And, but they both stand, I think they both stand alone pretty mm -hmm. well. When, um, when you first published, or going back to when you first started really thinking about working hard at it. Mm -hmm. Did you imagine that you were going to have a brand that is sort of demons and devils and spirits and fantasy stuff? Um, and comedy. And comedy. that's the element that they all share. My yes. books will I would go from Shakespeare to marine mammal biology to uh, you know, this 1940s noir, but the thing they all have in common is they're funny. And I did imagine that if I was going to make it, that was going to be the element that remained there because that's what, I guess if you would describe it as talent, that's what I had. Mm -hmm. That's what I could do is I could tell a story. I, I initially, by the way, thought I was going to be a horror story writer. And in the early 80s, I went to a writer's conference in Santa Barbara, and I took my horror stories, and I read them in workshops, and everybody laughed <laughs> um, and, and with me but I, because of the way I turned a phrase. And I thought, well, I guess that's what I do. Um, and so my first book was Practical Demon Keeping, which I um, sold in 1990. I was writing in the late 80s. And <clears throat> pardon me, I told a writer, I remember sitting on the couch with a writer friend of mine, an aspiring writer, and I said, I want to do for horror what Douglas Adams did for science fiction. Mm -hmm. And so that's what um, Practical Demon Keeping did. It sold, um, and it sold well. And so I wrote another one, and I wrote another one, and I wrote another one. And the thing that is in common, uh, that they all have in common in regards to the elements, there's usually something supernatural, and that's probably because I just have a short attention span and I need something weird to happen. And, but that, as you said, has become my brand. Yeah. Is people, you know, if something, my, my book Fluke is about marine mammal biologists, and the first half of it is pretty accurate, the mm -hmm. business of doing marine mammal biology. I remember that. And so people will 
write to me and say, well, I wasn't sure about that book for the first 150 pages. And then all of a sudden they said, shoes off in the whale. Yeah. And I knew we were in a Chris Moore book. And by the same token, people who weren't aware of it said, I, you know, hadn't discovered me before and saw me on television or something. And they said, well, I, I, read the first, I read the book and I was fine with it for the first 100 pages. And then it just went off the rails and it got weird. And I was like, there you go. Um, and so I, I just have learned by experience and feedback through email and stuff that that's what people expect from me. I like doing it, um, taking disparate things and making them work together in a story. And uh, as long as people like it, I'll keep writing them. You've mentioned several times now that your stories have gone off the rails. When you sit down and you start working on the story, I take it you're not a plotter, you're more of a pantser? A um, little bit of both. Depends on the story. Uh, some of my books are, are pretty meticulously researched. Um, I've done a couple of historicals where it, the research alone took me a couple of years. Um, Sacre Bleu is about the French Impressionists, and it covers a 40-year span of the late 1800s in Paris. And uh, my book, Lamb, is the gospel according to Biff, and it's the, the lost years of the life of Christ told from his best friend Biff, who was written out of the Bible for being a rascal. And, and those books, there's a certain amount of reality that dictates what you have to, that's your outline. You know, where do I have to, now with the life of Christ, it was like there's 30 years, we don't know where he was. So I was by a pantser at that point, you're right. But, but with the Impressionists, they knew what those guys had for breakfast every day. So I had to work, the, that became my outline, is where, do this guy, where does this guy have to be in 1863 and 1891 and stuff like that. Um, the other thing is that because I'm a, I do this for a living now and I have multiple book contracts, um, sometimes I have to outline because I can't afford to be stuck. Yeah. You know, and, and that's, that's what you run into if you're just trying to make it up as you go along, is that you'll, run, you'll get into a corner, and I have always gotten myself out of it, but I might be there for six months. Um, and, and I can't afford to do that because I have a contract that says this book is due in January of a certain year and you better have it done. So, um, so a little bit of both. Yeah. When you were growing up, were you a smart ass? Yes, very much so. <laughs> very much so, yeah. It shows. I, have, um, I had on my website for a while and, and in social media my first grade report card. And, um, and it said, uh, um, Chris is a very is a bright precocious child and just doesn't really know when it's time for him to not talk or something yeah. along those lines and mm -hmm. I, I had found it in some old photos that somebody uh, an interviewer had said do you have a, fo a photo of yourself as a kid and I found this old report card in there and I just sent that to them with this picture of me looking like a young uh, five-year-old weatherman with a sport coat on and a bow tie that was us yeah. well it may have been somebody else too but, <laughs> but you sent that photo to oh did us. I yes you yeah. did oh wow it's great um, on the research part I came across something that I thought was fascinating when I wrote my first novel it was set in Bakersfield mm -hmm. um, and my most recent novel was set in Boston and in both cases um, I, and then one in the Bay Area and I went out there too but I went to the town mm -hmm. and I spent a couple days getting a feel for the town, what were the hot spots, what, you know, what did mm -hmm. people do, and all of that. And I read something recently that a big part of your research is going and actually moving to a location so that you can absorb the environment in order to write. Um, yeah, I, the other thing, I think that goes back to the comedy thing that I talked about, Larry. There's an accuracy aspect and then there's sort of a a verisimilitude accent, uh, uh, um, aspect wherein you have a detail that makes it real. I remember going to, for my Jesus book, I went to Israel and I went to Nazareth. And the country around Nazareth is just brutal. It looks like you, the photos of Mars, just giant boulders in these yeah. barren fields. And, um, and I thought, and, and then when you read about the people of the time making this on foot pilgrimage to Jerusalem, which is quite a ways, in sandals five times a year, you think these were some tough human beings. Wow. And so that informed that. But the other thing is, my reaction, my default setting is, is comedy. So when I see something, often it, the comedy in a book isn't from, oh, these characters are in this situation. It's, I've reacted to something I see 
and then I work it into the comedy of the book. And so I'll take those notes and plug them into the book when I get to that part. So it's a little bit of both, but there's definitely, um, even if the people I'm writing about have been dead for 2,000 years or 600 years, there's something that is added to it by being in that place and experiencing the, I guess, atmosphere, geography, however yeah. you want to say it. The latest book, Razzmatazz, takes place in San Francisco, which is where right. you live. So you didn't have to travel to get a lot of that, but you had to research going back 75 years or right. something like that. Yeah, 75 to 120, because I do, this one, a lot of it takes place at the turn of the 20th century. But the, the great thing, and, and this is something that I like about cities, is you should really destroy them occasionally. And then they got, when they get built, they all look alike. You know, um, and uh, Paris is that way. They razzed all of Paris in the mid-1800s. And so if you drive around the inner Paris, it all looks alike. Those mm. mansard roofs and those six-story buildings and all that, that was, that was planned. Um, and San Francisco was destroyed in 1906 by the earthquake. And so it looks a lot now like it did in 1947. So the physical aspects of it are not that different because the, you know, it's Victorian buildings, most of them built in, you know, 1906, 1907, 1908, 1909. Um, and then the buildings around those built to match them. You know, there's probably less neon now than there was in 1947. Um, but people were complaining about how slow the cable cars were and how they blocked traffic in 1947. And I had the advantage of the columns of Herb Cain, who was right. writing for the San Francisco Chronicle and the Examiner for 70 years. Something. He was their man on the street. And so a lot of the elements of street life, which is what my characters are experiencing, came from that. Um, but you're right. I, I, was, um, I was already there. I was living on streets that I was writing about. And so that made it, it, made it fun. You know? um, I used maps, too. When I was writing about Paris in the 1890s, I used maps. And, and that helps you get an idea of how the characters can move around a city and so forth. Yeah. When I was in high school, I wrote an article for our high school paper because the BART mass transit system just opened up at mm -hmm. that time. So I drove up to Fremont, drove up to another city, jumped on BART, took it to San Francisco, got out, walked around, not really knowing where I was going. Mm -hmm. And I wound up in a couple of you know, pretty interesting places where there were women out there trying to Mm -hmm. You know, talk me to coming inside to the mm -hmm. bar, you know, and I go, I'm, I'm 17. Ah, come on in, you know, we'll take care of you. Mm -hmm. uh, that was, that was interesting. Um, I believe that was probably the Tenderloin district. Probably. Um, I remember one of my early experiences at uh, San Francisco was on Broadway and Columbus area, um, which is featured in most of my books, because they most of them take place in North Beach, Russian Hill, Chinatown, and that's the uh, the intersection of all those neighborhoods. But uh, there were all these barkers. Um, I'd go into a cafe called Enrico's to have a cup of coffee late at night, and there were uh, guys calling, you know, in for strip joints all up and down Broadway, yeah. because that when sailors went on leave, that's where they went. And on a weekend, um, there was just this sea of white uniforms and bell bottoms up and down Broadway, and, and uh, that doesn't exist anymore. But at the time, it was it was something to see. I remember sitting at a, in Rico's one time, and it was in the afternoon, having a cup of coffee, and this this rather tall and improbably built young woman got out of a car, very short hair, and then reached into her trunk and, and pulled out a giant white boa constrictor and wrapped it around her, her, her neck as she got everything. And she was just a stripper on, on ship change. And that's the sort of detail that you can't make up. That's something that you go, okay, that's going to go in a book somewhere. As you were telling that story and you said, she, you know, she got out of the car and wrapped around her. And my first thought was, it has to be a snake or something like that because mm -hmm. that is Christopher Moore. Yeah, and I didn't make that up. That happened. Um, but uh, but the, the, I think that the Tenderloin has always been sketchy, yeah. you know, um, and that's not because, as you would think from national news coverage, that the City Fathers are just irresponsible. It's because, you know, Dashiell Hammett's character, um, Sam Spade, lives in the Tenderloin. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and one of the, 
the most exclusive men's clubs in the world, uh, the Bohemian Club, is in the Tenderloin. It's, um, that was the theater district for years and years and years. And then during World War II, when um, the, we needed defense workers and we needed them on the coast, they needed a place to live. And, they, and it usually it was single men and women, that, and so they put up these residency hotels. And it changed the city char charter so that they had to remain uh, single residency hotels to, for the defense effort. Well, that means that now those places, um, those single residency hotels, are the last place you go before you're homeless. All right, one more question before we get to our lightning round. Sure. Of your books, there's 18 now? Right. Uh, of your 18 books, which one's your favorite? Um, well, I like to say that, the, you know, they're like your children. You know, you have your youngest and you have, you know, you, you have your first and then you have the one that you've locked in the attic and don't let anybody see. Um, but uh, I don't know. I think Sacre Bleu is, is because it was so, um, certainly the most successful is Lamb, the Gospel according to Biff. But Sacre Bleu was such an enormous rock to pick up to try and write a, a full length historical novel about the color blue. And, and in it, the biographies of Toulouse-Lautrec and Vincent van Gogh and all these artists and so forth. So that's probably my favorite. Okay. All right, now it's time for the Austin Living Limits lightning round. Okay. I got 10 questions, 10 specific questions for gotcha. you. It's something that we stole from inside the actor's studio, but right. don't worry about it. They stole it from Bernard Pivot, who mm -hmm. stole it from Marcel Proust, who probably stole it from Moses, for all I know. Okay. Um, 10 questions. Here we go. What is your favorite word? Razzmatazz. Got to be razzmatazz. Mm -hmm. What's your least favorite word? Oh, gosh, hatred. Yeah? Yeah. OK. What turns you on? Hmm, laughter. I would get that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What turns you off? Mm. <laughs> I was going to say hatred again, but that seems like cheating. Um, cruelty. Okay. What is, what's your idea of happiness? Hmm. Making somebody I care about laugh and hearing them laugh. Yeah. Who is your favorite author? John Steinbeck, the comic stuff, not the not the stuff that everybody goes. Why are you, would you pick Steinbeck? But you know, Cannery Row, Sweet Cannery Thursday. Cannery Row, Sweet Thursday. And Tortilla, Tortilla Flat. Tortilla Flat. Uh, the short Sweet Life of Pippin the Fourth. Yeah. yeah, yeah, He's my favorite author too. When people Great ask voice. Me that. I, I Great like voice. That. Um, if you could be a character from a novel at any particular time, who would you want to be? Hmm. Maybe Captain Blood. Captain Blood. Mm -hmm. Interesting choice. Yeah, Scaramouche, one of those Raphael Sabatini romantic pirate novel kind of things. I love it. Mm -hmm. Can you do a sword? I cannot, but mm -hmm. I, I as, when I was a kid, I aspired to. I thought that was something I would do, but I haven't. You probably are living your dream by being a writer Absolutely. as a profession. Absolutely. But if you could not be a writer, if you couldn't be an author, what profession would you like to attempt? Given that I have some acumen for it, which I don't know, I don't think, a uh, painter probably, a, a fine art painter. Mm -hmm. What profession would you least want to do? Sewer worker. Yeah. 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 I get that. Um, our final question. Mm -hmm. If heaven exists, what would you like God to say to you when you reach the check-in desk? Well done. Well done. And this has been well done. Chris, thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, Larry. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it. Thanks. This has been a presentation of Austin Liddy Limits, made possible with help from our good friends at Blue Ink Review typing the end is just the beginning. 
Find out more at blueinkreview.com.